So we're going to start the year with a bang by ending the year with a bang. Lynn, um, firstly, how are you? And Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. What an amazing year you've had. Uh, Merry Christmas to you. Uh, both of us uh, talked before the recording that we've had quiet uh, Christmases for a change. Um, and so I, I've had a good time. It's definitely been a big year. Um, you've had a big year too. You've been traveling, uh, you know, kind of doing some of these major, I think, uh, pieces of journalism, I would call it. Uh, and so yeah. I think they're really powerful. Yeah, we've got the uh, Lebanon one coming out uh, very shortly. Actually, I need Danny's help. We've got to record the monologues for that, but they'll come out shortly. Yeah, no, it's been uh, it's been an incredible year, even though it's been a bear market. It's been uh, it's been an incredible year. So, okay, there's a bunch we're going to want to get through. We want to recap last year. We want to talk about next year. Everyone's eyes are going to be glued to the show on Monday. The Oracle, Lynn Alden. Everyone's going to know what you're thinking, what you're saying. Uh, just before we get into that, congratulations on the book. I know it smashed it. I've seen relentless, relentless. I even saw it yesterday. Uh, people, people were posting their Christmas present, and it was Lynn Alden's book. <laughs> well, I appreciate your support of it early on. Uh, you know, we did those interviews about it, and so that helped it. You know, get a strong start. And of course, Amazon algorithms and things like that always like strong starts. So I appreciate the the assist you gave it. We'll always do that. Can you? I don't. I don't know if you can do this. Can you talk about how many copies you've sold, or is that a secret? Uh, yeah. I mean, it's it's over thirty thousand uh, copies <laughs> sold uh, since uh, it came out in late August. Uh, which for a five hundred page finance book is um, numbers I'm happy with. And it's still the good news is though after the initial burst, uh, it's reached kind of a steady state where it's it's not really diminishing at the current time. It's it's selling as much per day now as it was last month. Uh, and so there seems to be a pretty long tail with it. So I think that we'll sell tens of thousands more uh, and reach more and more people. Do you know if it's penetrated many people outside of our kind of Bitcoin world? Uh, so the the two main areas were Bitcoin world and macro world. Uh -huh. um, and I, so I, it is reaching a number of people that are not kind of, you know, fully Bitcoin native. Uh, it's, you know, it's reaching people that are generally familiar with my work or uh, that come across me on interviews and things like that. You know, there's not a huge distribution globally. Um, and so the distributions, uh, you know, coming from people that come across my work somewhere or another. Uh, we're also working on translations. I mean, over the next couple of years, we hope to have, you know, 10 plus languages uh, translated. So, it, you know, the, the I, I, as much as I can, I don't want language to be a barrier for people to put access and especially because the the people that it needs to reach the most are not necessarily english speaking or at least uh, english speaking as a first language in many cases and so uh we are working on that kind of second stage which is um you know making it more globally accessible it has i i some of my favorite purchases are people you know posting pics from norway or korea or you know japan or wherever else kind of showing their copy so it is available uh in a lot of different jurisdictions but it's it's currently only the english version it's a bit like that with the podcast when you go into libsyn and you look at where are people listening and we've got this one listener and i think it's in south sudan and I really want to know who this person is. But yeah, you should see all these random little locations. You're like, this is amazing. Yeah. Well, listen, congratulations. I, I've got no idea how much work goes into writing a book. I know you were busy and it's got to be a lot. So congratulations on that. That's, that's amazing what you've done. Okay. It's been a fairly crazy year. Um, what I will say is that it kind of feels like we haven't had a meltdown that I feared we would. It feels like things have kind of stabilized a little bit. Obviously, if I put that to you, you might be like, yeah, Pete, you've got no idea the meltdown that's coming or what's happening in the background or the reason things are stabilized. But certainly during the time of the banking crisis, I was very fearful that some kind of huge meltdown was coming. And I know we've still got risks of going in and out of inflation over the next decade. You've been telling me you think this is a decade of inflation. But I think a good place to start is to say, Lynn, where, where the hell are we at right now? Bro I know it's a broad question, but you know, across across the macro, across the economy, kind of where are we at, and how have we not gone into complete meltdown? So I think 2023 was a story about fiscal forces and monetary forces uh, offsetting each other, 
uh, roughly equally. And if either one was winning, it was more the fiscal side. And what I mean by that is that you know throughout 2022, the Federal Reserve, as we all know, was tightening monetary policy. They were raising interest rates. They were reducing their balance sheet. And most assets uh, had a very bad year in 2022. So st- stocks had a big problem, especially growth stocks. Um, Bitcoin obviously went down a ton. Uh, most other assets did poorly. Uh, normally, in those types of environments, bonds hold up pretty well, but even they went down. And so, pretty much across the board, uh, if you were not in cash or you know a small select uh, a, a set of in- idiosyncratic investments, just about everything went down. Uh, but by early 2023. Uh, we started to see a little bit of a reversal. In fact, it, it kind of started in late 2022, which is basically that the Treasury began offsetting some of that Fed tightening. And so throughout 2023, the Federal Reserve has still been tightening. They, you know, rates, rates are ending the year higher than they started. Uh, the Federal Reserve's uh, balance sheet is lower than it started the year. So the Federal Reserve has, even though they've decelerated their course of tightening, they still are tightening. Uh, but what's different about uh, kind of late 2022 and all of 2023 compared to the you know the first three quarters of 2022 is that the treasury is offsetting it and they've they've done that in two primary ways so from the, the fourth quarter of 2022 uh, through the first quarter uh, first two quarters of 2023 so you know that kind of eight nine month period um, they were drawing down their cash balance and pushing it back into the market. Um, partially that was because they, they had too much cash above their target, and then it, it accelerated because of the debt ceiling. So rather than emptying some of their cash into the financial system, they had to empty literally all of it uh, up until the end of May of this year. Um, and then the second stage was that the Treasury then had a choice. Uh, you know, if, if they went back to normal operation, you'd have the Fed tightening and there'd be no offset. And we probably would have had a second stage of liquidity crisis. Instead, the Treasury said, okay, we're going to issue a ton of short duration bonds, T-bills, uh, instead of the the longer duration or basically the, the, the overall ratio of debt issuance is going to be very much skewed uh, abnormally much towards that short end. And what that did was allowed money that was sitting in the reverse repo markets, uh, which is you know, for lack of a better word, it's kind of money that's like excess demand for T-bills. It's like excess cash that's sucked out of the banking system. It's, it's, it's kind of parked at the Fed, um, but not owned by the Fed. It's parked at the Fed. And issuing a ton of extra T-bills allowed that capital to come in back into the financial system. Uh, and so that was another lever that the Treasury pulled to, to offset the Fed's quantitative tightening. And so, for example, bank reserves are not any lower now than they were in the banking crisis. That kind of that kind of stress tested their lower end, uh, and you know, almost a year later, you know, 10, 10 months later, um, bank reserves aren't any lower, even though the Federal Reserve has still been tightening, and that's because the Treasury has has used these other offsets uh, to offset it. And so, basically, the the story over the past two years was, you know, three quarters of tightening overall, Fed tightening, and kind of a neutral treasury, and then about five quarters of roughly balanced treasury and Fed actions. And so various global liquidity measures are higher now than they were in kind of the worst point, which was late 2022. Uh, And Bitcoin's price action and many other risk assets price action tends to be highly correlated with global liquidity. And it also just so happens that Bitcoin is, is, from my analysis, more correlated with liquidity than any other asset that I that I track. Okay, would you say the Fed has done a good job? Like, how would you gra- would you give them a grade? Are they an F? Are they an A? Are they a B? How have they done? So it's challenging because if if you don't really think central banking is the best uh, framework to begin with, it's hard to evaluate how they're doing. Uh, in terms of following their mandate, um, I think they're doing a fairly good job, um, at least. In the past couple of years, I think they they made missteps in 2020 and 2021 by not anticipating that inflation would come. I think they basically underestimated the uh, quantity theory of money. Uh, you know, they you know the supply of money is not the only factor in inflation, but it's a big factor for inflation, uh, and they severely underestimated it. Uh, I think their models were wrong, their theory was wrong. Um, and they got punched in the face basically because of it. They got embarrassed. Um, now, not all the inflation was their fault. A lot of it was the fiscal authority, right? So it's not just the Fed deciding how much 
money exists, they're they're working with the treasury to to supply it. So it's not just them that caused it, although they contributed to it. Now, once inflation came, uh, they pivoted and they got very tight, uh, and which is generally what they're supposed to do. Uh, in that, you know, they basically wanted to curtail credit growth. They wanted to curtail speculation. They wanted to bring down asset prices because that helps reduce demand. And therefore, get back to a supply-demand equilibrium, which can help get prices down. I think the big challenge that the Fed faces is that a lot of this is outside of their control. Their their tools are mainly around um, basically adjusting the level of bank lending. So there's really two two main ways that broad money comes into existence. One is very large fiscal deficits are run and monetized by the central bank and the broader banking system. And number two is that banks decide to lend for various reasons. Um, and for example, in the 1970s, most of the money supply growth was from bank lending. Uh, in the 1940s, and then again in the 2020s, these were other inflationary environments, most of the new money creation was not from bank lending. It was from monetized fiscal deficits. And the problem is that the Fed has no control over fiscal deficits. Uh, you know, they, Their main tools are kind of built around the assumption that bank lending drives most money supply growth. Um, and so they can, they can slow down the rate of bank lending, which they've done. Uh, they can, you know, they can damage the wealth effect to varying degrees, and therefore slow down spending, which they've, they've, you know, at least for a while, it was working. Um, but their tools can't really address fiscal, which is the primary driver of inflation in this cycle. So, given the tools they have, they're they're kind of following the textbook of what they should be doing. So it's hard to give them too too bad of a grade, um, even though I I. You know, I think the whole model is is challenged and antiquated. I mean, I really wrote a book called Broken Money to kind of bring <laughs> yeah. attention to how how uh, you know this is very outdated tech. But I guess the, the people managing the tech are, you know, doing a, a decent job of it at, at least ever since they pivoted. Right. I managed to follow almost all of that. I think uh, I think after doing twenty odd interviews with you, I'm starting to pick some of this up. But sorry, just explain to me monetized fiscal deficits. Just exactly what that is. Okay, so there's two sides to that. One is fiscal deficits, and one is whether or not it's monetized. So fiscal deficits are just they're spending more to the economy than they're taxing from the economy, right? Mm-hmm. So we're our deficits are very large, uh, both in absolute terms and as a percentage of GDP. Monetized basically refers to who's financing that deficit. Uh, if they issue a ton of bonds and the public buys the bonds, <clears throat> then it's a it's not a monetized fiscal deficit. Basically. Uh, money's coming out of the real economy through taxes and people that are voluntarily buying these bonds. So they're giving up spending and they're instead buying these bonds or paying these taxes. And then that money's being put back into the economy somewhere else. Uh, and you know that, that can be inflationary, uh, but to a somewhat limited degree because it's not really aggressively increasing the uh, money supply because money's being pulled out and put back in. However, when the central bank increases, basically creates new bank reserves and buys a significant portion of the debt issuance to fund those deficits, then money's being spent into the economy that's not being pulled out anywhere from the real economy. So just more money is coming into existence. Like our our, our aggregate deposits are, and, and money in circulation is all higher now than it was three years ago, for example. And is that when they are uh, buying the bonds themselves, but also maybe buying up debt from banks? Is that similar? Are, are they both count? Yeah. So basically, it depends on the country. In the United States, uh, the Fed can't really directly buy from the Treasury. Instead, they buy from the banks mostly that serve as intermediaries. So they make buy it. Yeah. So basically, banks go, yeah. out, banks go out and buy the bonds. Then they turn around and sell it right to the Fed that created new base money to buy that. And then that allows those banks as middlemen to go out and buy more bonds and then sell them to the Fed. Uh, in addition, um, they can also buy from non-bank entities, you know, insurance funds, pension funds, things like that. They can, uh, you know, a lot of times that will go through banks as intermediaries. But basically, yeah, they buy in the secondary market uh, and that helps those secondary market participants go out and buy more bonds again. Uh, and so basically, the, the end result is that money is spent into the economy that's not extracted from the economy. The other way to, the other way to monetize deficits is to get uh, other commercial banks to buy the bonds because they, you know, their fractures are banking – 
And so they can they can still uh, contribute to broad money supply increases by buying bonds. Um, and so there are some eras where that becomes important too. So for example, the 1940s, it was not just the Fed buying treasuries. It was also commercial banks were buying a lot of the treasuries and therefore the money multiplier was increasing. So as long as the the um, non-bank public is not buying a lot of those um, bonds, then then you know they're being monetized. But especially if the central bank's doing it. Now, in the past uh, little while, um, neither the commercial banks or the Fed are buying most of the bonds, and so at the current time, it's not really being monetized. Early in in the kind of the whole pandemic response, those initial deficits were heavily monetized in the United States, in Europe, uh, many other places. Um, but ever since central banks have been trying to tighten, they're no longer monetizing them, at least for as long as they can. Uh, they're, they're, that's part of what they're trying to do by being more tight monetarily, is they're trying to get more of the private sector to absorb those bonds and therefore spend less or bid up other asset prices less. But they they have struggled to have people buying the bonds. There was that pretty calamitous uh, bond auction that James Lavish uh, wrote about. Uh, I'm going to say, was it like three months ago? I'm trying to remember. What what is the state of the bond market? Because it, it does feel like, I mean, I don't fully understand it, but it does feel like uh, it's a lever that doesn't have the power that it used to have for raising capital. So it's better than it was three months ago for now. Um, and it's better than it was at the end of 2022. So I, I previously mentioned that kind of the worst part of liquidity was late 2022. That was when the uh, UK guilt market blew up. Uh, basically, the, the central bank was you know trying to do quantitative tightening, had a, a meeting scheduled for uh, balance sheet reduction, uh, at which they had to cancel the next day because instead they had to go out and increase their balance sheet to buy bonds um, because you had a negative feedback loop uh, that was going to go on, and they had to come in and fix that with monetization, at least temporary monetization. And, and we and we lost the prime minister over it. And yeah, you lost the prime minister over it. It shows these things are non-trivial. The United States at the time, uh, you know, the treasury market didn't break like the gilt market did, but it did get very wobbly. Uh, so you know, back in March 2020, the treasury market broke. Uh, like literally, there were there were treasuries that just. It went no bid essentially. The bid ask spread blew out. Liquidity was insufficient. It was kind of like a crisis in markets. Uh, the Fed came in and gave a liquidity bazooka. Uh, in in late 2022, you know that kind of September October timeframe, the U.S. Treasury market was starting to show early signs of that, but not quite outright breaking like the U.K. gilt market did. Uh, but that's also when the U.S. Treasury started coming back in, uh, flooding the market with liquidity. The Bank of England was doing the same temporarily. And then these other factors are kind of caught up. Uh, and so, you know, at the current time, you know, 2023 has been a, a pretty, you know, vol like a high volatility year for bonds. They've rallied towards the end of the year. And a lot of that triggered when the Treasury decided to issue a ton of T-bills instead. They basically gave a negative supply shock by saying, hey, we're not going to issue as many long duration bonds as, as you feared. Instead, we're going to issue a, a lot of T-bills. Um, and so that that's taken some of the edge off uh, the bond market. Now, I still, there's still an ongoing issue of so much bond issuance, as far as the eye can see, especially in the United States. Um, but you know, these things are not linear, and so the the market has cooled over the past quarter. And with inflation down to three percent, well, actually, I've got a couple of questions on that. Uh, inflation supposedly down to three percent. Do you, do you believe it is three percent? And I know it's all subjective; it depends. What, what you're buying. Um, is there a chance also that they may overshoot and we may see sub two, even sub 1%? Um, uh, uh, where are we at with inflation? Well, so people were worried about that um, more so earlier this year when they were talking about recession quite a bit. Uh, you know, it is possible they could go below 2% temporarily. Um, to answer the question of, of whether or not inflation is that low, it partially depends on what you're looking at. But for example, if you look at energy prices, you know they're they're generally lower than they were a year ago. Uh, if you look at um, say house prices in the U.S., uh, they're about flat from a year ago. So they started to fall a little bit from their bubble peak, but then they started rising again, and they're roughly flat. Um, you know, worker wages and consumer prices are generally still uh, inching up. Some of it is measured with a lag. And so, for example, the official CPI statistics for house inflation, like shelter inflation, uh, in my opinion, they 
underestimated um, how much inflation occurred there. Um, you know, there's there's various kind of sophisticated ways to look at this. You can look at you know what is what is actual house price inflation doing? What is what are actual rents doing on a real time basis versus kind of this le- this like janky six month lagging CPI figure? So they under underestimated it. Uh, but that over time starts to reverse itself a little bit, which is there's actually a, a few months, I think, where they were overestimating shelter growth because their lagging indicator was still catching up to what already happened. Uh, so in general, yeah, I think inflation is still not uh, low, but it is somewhere in the ballpark of what they're measuring it to be. Even if you know there's independent inflation measures like true inflation, some of them are you know showing numbers that are slightly below the official averages and again that's that's largely because shelters probably acting with a lag so yeah we are in a uh, what i would consider a genuine uh disinflationary environment uh from a high level um but the reason a lot of people don't feel it is because disinflation does not mean prices go back down to where they were at least on average like oil prices can and you know some specific prices can but prices in aggregate don't go back down to where they were three years ago. Uh, they just stop increasing at the high rate that they were during their peak. Uh, and so there's a there's a permanent increase in the supply of money, and then there's a permanent increase in at least the majority of prices. Hmm. With the uh, bank insolvency issue we had, and the um, I call it the buy the fucking print <laughs> program. Um, has that also stabilized? I know there are people still, oh, there are banks who are still accessing that program, but has that itself stabilized? Do you think we're at risk of any other banks being lost? So that's stabilized as long as um, bond prices don't completely blow out again. I mean, as long as, yeah. pr- as bond prices stay relatively range bound, uh, that's that's fixable over time because those aren't defaults; those are duration problems. Hmm. Um, that program went through a couple phases, so it was heavily used initially. Uh, and then over time, it consolidated. And some of the other types of, you know, that's not the only lending that the Fed does. Um, that happened to be one, basically the most generous facility. Um, uh, but they they have other kind of more punitive facilities that were being used. And over the course of, you know, roughly a year, some of the lending has kind of come out of other pockets and and gravitated towards this. So the overall Fed lending has decreased quite a bit. Even as uh, the BTFP program has has been kind of stable, and then in the past couple months, it's been increasing again. Uh, initially, there were people saying, "Oh, this this is evidence of bank failures," whereas me and some others are pointing out that there's there's arbitrage taking place. Uh, that basically those facilities um, are more you know kind of like cheaper than what the Fed pays on bank reserves. <laughs> so there's actually this kind of perverse incentive to go out and borrow from this facility and deposit it at the Fed. And earn a risk-free spread. Um, That's hilarious. Uh, and yes, it's you know you, you can borrow from the, you, you know you borrow from the Fed, make money off the make money off the Fed. It's it's not great. Uh, it's a pretty small number as far as overall banking capital is concerned. So it's more of like a narrative joke than something super meaningful. Um, but yeah, that that program has somewhat stabilized. The big question is that uh, by the end of quarter one of 2024, that that program is supposed to expire. And there's still some capital in there. So the question is, do they let it expire? Do they extend it? Or do they, you know, do they transform that liquidity into something else uh, to try to avoid some sort of like temporary liquidity shock? Uh, I, I think in general, uh, you know, while I'm not super negative on liquidity for 2024, uh, it might not be quite as smooth as it's been for the bulk of 2023. I, I think that, you know, people ask me for my liquidity predictions or my Bitcoin price predictions. I, I have been hesitant to give 2024 ones because there's some decision points ahead. Uh, but I keep reiterating that I think the the spectrum of 2024 and 2025 will be positive for liquidity and positive for things like Bitcoin price and other things like that. But there are some turbulence factors, I think, ahead in 2024 where they might not materialize, but there's a decent chance that they will. So my, my conviction is more about the two-year period than the one-year period, if that makes sense. What's your range? You don't have to give us a price prediction. I'll, I'll tell you my, my. I'll tell you my bottom end. I'll tell you Danny's top end. Tell me. Well, I, I, I think, I think it'd be in, very cool and incredible for Bitcoin if we get to around one hundred fifty thousand. Danny's like, nope, we're going to half a million dollars for Bitcoin. I can't get my head around this. Neither number would particularly surprise me, to be honest. Um, what you know, when I, when I, 
<laughs> yeah, when I, it's how it works. It's, you have a supply scarce asset. It's high volatility. Um, there's a multiplier effect. So when capital comes in, the price, you know, if, if like fifty billion in capital comes in, that can drive the price by several hundred billion, the market cap by several hundred billion. Um, when I review my price predictions from the last cycle, you know, when Bitcoin was like nine thousand, I was talking about thirty to fifty thousand. Uh, and I was talking, you know, when it started to kind of hit that twenty, thirty thousand mark, I was doing interviews saying I think it's going to hit a trillion market cap, which is you know a little under fifty thousand a coin, and it touched all that. Uh, after that, I said, well, you know, it, the bull market's playing out. I, you know, I'm I'm looking for like a hundred, hundred twenty thousand. Uh, I wasn't trying to be too specific. I was kind of on the conservative end of what a lot of estimates were. We didn't really touch those. You know, we only got to around sixty nine thousand. So we we met my first estimate we did not meet my second estimate uh last cycle uh this cycle you know one thing i I keep stressing about my liquidity correlation that i've been pointing out is that bitcoin is highly correlated with with um you know bitcoin is highly correlated with liquidity in terms of direction but there's very little way to judge a price from it right it's not really useful for magnitude so it's not one of those like stock to flow models we can say okay this date it should be this price like I, i i think that a lot of that is really hard to judge. Uh, you know, I my base case expectation is for new all-time highs, hopefully over 100k, so hopefully six figures. But then, literally, that range, like you, you, you both gave your numbers. That range, I think, is entirely reasonable, and I wouldn't, I, I actually be hesitant to guess where that ends up. I think that something like a hundred thousand plus would would be kind of disappointing for a bull market cycle, especially after. The prior bull market cycle was on the disappointing end too, so I'd kind of hope for two hundred thousand or more um, over the next two plus years. Um, but again, I you know other than other than kind of stressing that Bitcoin t- does tend to be very correlated with liquidity, and that I think it'll be materially higher in two years. Um, the range for what it could be is based on so many things that are hard to judge. What are the Bitcoin? You know, are are the ETFs indeed going to be approved as everyone expects? Uh, what's the amount of capital that's going to flow into them? Um, are we, are we going to get any other surprise nation state shocks or, or changes? Uh, what's going to happen with some of these liquidity effects we just talked about? For example, if we have a negative liquidity environment, say the middle of 2024, uh, you could have a pretty big correction uh, before eventually going higher. And so there's 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 a huge array of variables that I would be uh, very hesitant to try to guess. A negative liquidity event in a election year is a pretty disastrous scenario for an incumbent, right? Uh, that would be. I think that there are liquidity shocks that go unnoticed by the public because they're addressed quickly. Um, and so, an example of that was September 2019 repo spike. Uh, that's something that if you're in macro Twitter, uh, that was like all you talked about for that month. It was a huge thing, but the average person had no idea it happened. Um, the March 2023 banking crisis was somewhere in the middle where it made headline news, but the majority of people were not in any way affected by it. Like barely any jobs were lost over it. You know, most deposits were not affected in any way. It was kind of this like little brief industry shock that, you know, a lot of, more affected Silicon Valley bros than like the average person. Uh, and then of course there's something like extreme like recession or, or even bigger than a recession that affects everybody. Uh, and so statistics show that pre, you know presidents rarely win re-election if there's a recession that year. Uh, liquidity shocks are different because it depends on what the response to the liquidity shock is. Uh, basically, we have to ask questions like, you know, I talked before about the two levers that the Treasury is doing to offset the Fed. So one uh, was draining their cash balance. And two was reverse repos. So uh, this year, they they realistically can't repeat the first one. Uh, technically, it's possible, but it's unlikely. And reverse repos only have about a trillion left. So you know, more than a half the facility has been drawn down. Um, they could still draw it down more by issuing more and more T bills. I expected to generally gradually. I, I expected to probably end 2024 materially lower than 2023. They could aggressively draw it down in half a year or less. Um, and the question is, what happens after that? Will the Fed get more dovish um, and go back to kind of gradual balance sheet expansion? Um, but you know, there could be frictions along that path. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily expect them to be uh, 
huge. I, I, I kind of think of the September 2019 repo spike or the March 23 banking crisis as, as probably closer to what we'd expect from any, any sort of liquidity shocks in 2024. As I mentioned earlier, Lynn, everything seems relatively calm now in the kind of macro environment. We, we haven't really had the recession that we feared that was coming. Uh, the bond market seems to have stabilized. The banking crisis seems to be over. Um, uh, yeah, the inflation is coming down, he, even so here in the UK. But I keep thinking back to what you said to me. I can't remember. It's like towards the start of the year, I, I think you said, you said uh, the story of this next decade is going to be inflation. So is this just mathematically things are being uh, like we're in a period of calm before re-entering a, a very similar scenario at some point in the future where it's going to be all the same issues, where it's going to be back to high inflation, even high, like even higher inflation, higher interest rates. Like, are we mathematically heading in that direction, or is there a route out of this? I mean, there's always some uh, routes out, but in general, that's the direction things point in. Uh, I think the the catalysts and magnitudes could be different. So, you know, the first few years of this decade were characterized by you know, lockdowns, huge supply shock, print a ton of money, literally give people stimulus checks, uh, give like wealthy people PPP loans to turn into grants, you know, kind of this whole, all, all sorts of different types of stimulus checks. Uh, and so increasing money supply, uh, frictions on the supply side, it's a huge recipe for inflation. Uh, so that kind of extreme uh, is is not necessarily going to repeat itself. Instead, uh, I think basically the, the key risk this decade is that the U.S., uh, and, and certain other developed countries can experience what emerging markets experience on a regular basis, where you just have kind of a higher backline level of, like a background level of inflation due to an unresolved fiscal problem. Um, and so the United States is just set to structurally run these massive fiscal deficits. And at some point, uh, you know, when things like the reverse repo were drained and other things like that, the Fed's going to have to go back to expanding their balance sheet uh, to accommodate those bonds. And that's 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 called fiscal dominance. It's where the central bank does not have full control over its decisions for things like, you know, what its balance sheet's going to be and other things like that, because the the amount of public debt and the amount of public deficits are kind of too big and forcing them to assist it. Um, and I think that's the story of the 2020s and probably the 2030s. Although you know, the longer you predict out, the more nonlinear things can happen and, and invalidate what you're saying. But basically, that's kind of the background structure. Um, then there's questions like, what's the timing of that going to be? Um, what kind of productivity offsets are we going to have? So, you know, the story of the past century, not just any given decade, but the century is money supply goes up a lot, but we also get way better at making things. And so, the, the scarcest things, you know, waterfront property, Van Gogh paintings, uh, to a lesser extent, gold and things like that, they, they go up in price by quite a bit, whereas it, it's partially offset by, you know, we're, we're better at producing electronics, we're better at building houses, we're better at, you know, building cars. There's other things that kind of offset it. And going forward, we have, we have obviously certain areas of massive productivity gains, AI being, being kind of the, the top of mind example. But there's other areas like energy abundance that I think could face recurring issues. Um, you know, we saw last year there was some acute energy crises uh, in 2022, and I don't think we've seen the end of those this decade. Um, at the current time, you know, China is in kind of near recession. Uh, much of Europe is in kind of borderline recession. Um, there have been certain developing countries that are struggling and therefore have demand destruction. Um, we've had new supply come online around the margins. And so things are kind of at equilibrium at the moment. But it only takes a small handful of um, either um, supply disruptions or marginal new demand in, say, a reaccelerating re or higher liquidity environment to cause another wave of energy inflation. You know, maybe not as bad as what Europe experienced there. But you could have a broader one. You could have one in the U.S. You could have just, you know, kind of more globally, um, you know, kind of oil issues. And so I think that you could have an issue where, you know, maybe CPI is not as high as, as people think because things like AI are offsetting it. But the price of what's actually scarce is going up by, by quite a bit. Uh, and so I think that's probably the story going forward. And you could have more structural loss of confidence in you know the the budgets of the United States and other major countries, basically, the market is able to put up with temporary things 
because the market says, okay, this is temporary. Uh, the Fed's going to get control of this. But over time, as the math becomes more and more apparent, and they say, okay, these bonds are going to like trillion dollar deficits as far as the eye can see. Uh, that's when you can get more structural, nonlinear shifts in perception, and then you can have these nonlinear inflation events, kind of like the seventies, uh, kind of like the forties. And I would expect, I'd be surprised if we end the decade without out having uh, more of these kind of spikes. And do you think they will get more extreme? That I don't know, to be honest. No. Um, you, because you can, depending on policy, you could spread it out. You know, you could you could average five percent inflation for several years. Or you can spike to nine percent and come back down to two percent, and spike to nine percent again, or twenty percent, or come back down. You know, a lot of a lot of people when they when they talk about this happening to developed countries, they they make it sound like it, it's doom. But like you know, in Egypt, they're they're dealing with thirty eight percent inflation at the current time, and life is still going on. Um, you know, you can you can have basically during times of war or sovereign debt crises. Developed countries have similar kind of effects of what you see in emerging markets, just generally at a less extreme level. Um, and so, you know, you have that kind of double digit type of inflation, not necessarily like the triple digit inflation you can get in some of these countries. It's not out of the realm of possibility, but it's it's generally it errs towards being less extreme. Uh, and so, I, I hesitate to predict magnitude, other than to just predict what is the what are the dominant trends going to be, which I think on average is. Our energy situation is not as abundant as it was last decade, and the fiscal dominance is a lot higher going forward, which, all else being equal, tends to be a more inflationary uh, kind of just uh, – things are running hot a little bit more, whereas last decade they were they were running pretty cold. Luke Woman said to us earlier in the year that he thinks there's a potential that we may see high double-digit or even triple-digit inflation as a way to kind of eviscerate the debt. He thinks that that's a tool that might be used. I I found it hard to believe, but the way he did explain it, he said he explained how Israel did it. It kind of sounded like a like a tool that would work, but just something that people in the West wouldn't accept. But you also then mentioned um, uh, developing countries go through this a lot. But like my experience from traveling is the reason a lot of people kind of cope and survive is they have access to dollars, so they get dollars. They know what to have instead. But when the dollar hyperinflates, I mean, we know, we think, well, maybe gold or Bitcoin, but I don't think a lot of people think that. I don't think people naturally have in, no, in the UK, people don't think, oh, it's high inflation, I'm going to get dollars. Uh, and I don't think people in the US saying, well, you know, well what, what alternative do they have? Because they are you know, the dominant sovereign currency. So is it not a slightly different scenario for, for coping with this if it's the US that hit high, even say high double digit inflation? Yeah, I think the closest example would be the '70s. Um, okay. And if you put if you put yourself in the role of the '70s, um, for the first time ever, the United States and the rest of the world was on a completely fiat currency standard. So it was like a, a new mm-hmm. era. And you know, a lot of people are saying this is this is never going to work. Um, and 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 you know, oil embargoes were happening, and money supply growth was above average, and inf- inflation over time was kind of spiraling out of control. Um, and so there was a. It resulted in a massive gold bubble. A lot of people piled into gold. Gold right. became a very large asset relative to equities, relative to the bond market, relative to the money supply. A lot of people poured into it, uh, and it you know it, it took like decades to to kind of surpass that that prior high in, in in gold price. That's how that's how big that got. So basically, that that shows what can happen when you know the even the dominant currency faces a major uh, crisis of confidence and people poured into what is available which in that sense was 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 gold um, in the modern times it'd probably be a combination of gold and bitcoin depending on you know how old you are what scale you're operating on um, you know what you know what you're what you're um, researched on things like that um, we're already seeing around the margin central banks are buying more gold. So there's there's not been a ton of demand for like gold ETFs and things like that. So without central bank buying, we probably would have seen lower gold. But because there is a pretty big central bank bid, uh, and that's partially inflation concerns, but I think a bigger uh, chunk of that is is confiscation concerns. Basically, that the the moneyness of treasuries and dollars is at question. If you're a country that's not in like perfect harmony with the United States, they say, "Well, at least, or at least, I want to back up. I don't want to have a hundred. I don't want to have all my eggs in one basket. I want to have some of my reserves in like self custody in our, you know, central bank vault 
uh, in our in our borders. Um, and so I, I think that there there could be a shift towards that. Um, and that's where you get those types of nonlinear events, right? That's why I, I would try to I wouldn't be like bold enough to say, okay, I think we're going to hit 12% inflation by this year, and then we're going to come back down. You know, th- that's it's, There's too many nonlinear things that can occur. And so instead, I just kind of keep track of the biggest things. There's the ongoing fiscal issue. There's the energy supply demand situation. Um, and then there's other technology offsets, things like AI. And these are kind of the big forces that are coming at each other. And so on a quarter by quarter, year by year basis, I'm kind of seeing, okay, how big are these forces? Which ones are winning? Which things are surprising me one way or another? Which things are kind of on track exactly how I thought? And so I'm, I'm very hesitant to give magnitudes. It's more just like focusing on these drivers and trying to give an under or an over. Like basically, mm-hmm. if the 2020s, I expect to be a more inflationary decade than the 2010s, but magnitude, who knows? Yeah, it will be interesting to see if we do hit these higher inflation numbers again, what kind of volume of people consider Bitcoin. And I'm always interested to know, because you you do live in these two uh, worlds. You've got the, your kind of Bitcoin world and your macro world, and I know they kind of overlap. But how much sentiment shift are you seeing towards Bitcoin? I mean, I'm feeling it myself. I think I think we're gradually starting to see more pro-Bitcoin or ne- let's even say neutral Bitcoin articles within the mainstream media. I mean, Forbes have been pretty pro with some of their articles. Uh, I even think the Economist article calling Bitcoin a cockroach, which was kind of like a backhanded compliment, but actually it was still a compliment because you can't kill it. They've come to that acceptance. Are you seeing a shift within your macro circles? Are you seeing some people who are maybe yeah, reticent to consider Bitcoin, maybe thinking, oh, hold on, actually, this might be an asset I should consider? Well, so before I answer that question, I'll answer um, that among institutions, I am seeing more of a recognition of fiscal dominance and concern around these ongoing fiscal deficits. Um, and you know, that's I, I'm I have some of a biased sample because I often find out about this because they read my work. But the, you know, for example, there will be major um, institutions that you'll know the name of, and someone will give me like an internal report, and it's like literally like it looks like something like me or Luke Groman wrote. And it's like, you know, major institution X, Y, Z, this is like their report on the fiscal dominance problem. And I'm like, wow. Okay, so that, that's things that were considered fringe or outside perspectives are now more normalized, right? So that's kind of the first part of, of this whole thing is like, it, is that happening among macro circles? Not all macro circles, but certainly around the margins, uh, including at major institutions. I would say, yeah, there's an ongoing realization that these fiscal issues are not a multi-decade problem now, that they're actually starting to have material effects in the present. Uh, and that's largely because you know we've had 40 years of rising debt to GDP offset by 40 years of falling interest rates. And so if interest rates merely go sideways from now on, let alone up, but if they just go sideways, those deficits no longer have an offset and that debt level no longer has an offset. And so that it, it becomes more spiraling. Um, which has consequences. So that's kind of the first step. For Bitcoin specifically, I mean, there are, you know, I talk to some bank boards that invite me to talk, you know, kind of talk to them about Bitcoin or, again, some of these fiscal problems. Um, You know, there are institutions that, you know, think it's rational to have an allocation. You know, sometimes you'll see um, people kind of, people that are not in the ecosystem are like, oh yeah, Bitcoin's all the millennials just kind of, um, you know, they'll kind of mix up Bitcoin and crypto and Mm -hmm. just kind of put all one basket and say, oh, that's what the crazy kids are doing. And it's like, well, you should see the people allocating to Bitcoin venture because, you know, these aren't kids. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, uh, At least most of them aren't. And, and these are, these are serious pools of capital. Uh, And, and so there, there is a increasingly, I think, aware, um, Perception and the way that I phrased it, uh, I was I was you know giving doing a fireside with Preston Pish and I pointed out that you know we've all seen like the the logarithmic Bitcoin chart, you know how I forget how many uh, peaks and trouts had now, but we we see all those peaks. You have to remember that the vast majority of people in the world have not seen that chart. Uh, in fact, I remember the first time I saw that chart, you know I never looked at Bitcoin's price in logarithmic form before. Um, I'd always see when you look at it in linear form, you see one of two things. It's either in what appears to be an insane bubble or it appears to be a broken bubble and it's dead. Mm-hmm. Uh, it rarely looks like anything other than those two. Um, whereas when you look at it in logarithmic form and you go back and study, okay, what was happening during these highs and lows each time, uh, you see this, this recurring cycle. 
And it, it's done this like three times, three, you know, kind of three, three times it's had a higher high after a 75% drawdown or more, sometimes like over 90%. And there's a handful of stocks that have done that, but I, I haven't found any stocks that have done it more than three times. And so if Bitcoin has another higher high, it'll be like the fourth time it's done this. Um, and But what we have to keep in mind is that, again, most people have not seen that chart. And instead, what most people see is only the ones that were happened while Bitcoin was big enough for them to be aware of it. So, for example, they saw the 2017 spike and then the crash, and then they saw the 2020 one spike and crash the higher high higher low so they've seen two right and and you know so they think okay there was a bubble and then there was a stimulus bubble and then it, it's dead that's how a lot of people saw it um whereas if those of us more in the space are saying no no this is uh still going strong under the surface when they see like a third higher high and you know maybe a third lower low and that that's where it becomes impossible to ignore because it's not just how many times Bitcoin's done it, it's how many times they've they've experienced it happen. And therefore, it's fully on their radar whether or not they've seen that logarithmic chart or not. And so I think that's where Bitcoin becomes more and more normalized among the institutions um, and it becomes less crazy to talk about it because it's, it's this asset that is just, it's not displaying characteristics of a traditional bubble. You know, people keep calling it tulips, but if you look at the tulip chart, it's like this three-year chart of just this insane spike and a crash. It didn't come back higher and higher multiple times over 15 plus years. Uh, and so once people see that happen more and more, they, it becomes normalized. Because there's a cockroach. Yes. Uh, if you check your Twitter DMs, there's a, there's a chart I have permanently open as a tab. I've sent you the one I have permanently open. It is a logarithmic chart. It is a long-term logarithmic chart with a few lines that I have drawn on it. Uh, and it's the thing that just gives me most confidence in Bitcoin as an asset. It's like a, it's, it's like my confidence chart, but it's basically just it shows me that there's like this consistent, always up trend. And it doesn't matter which of the lines you look at, because there's like four on there. It's still consistently always up, and so it just makes me feel like this is a secure and safe asset to be to be holding now. Um, just along those lines. Um, the reason I'm asking about, you know, is what's this acceptance in wider circles? It's, it is one of the most annoying, painful things about Bitcoin is the lack of legitimacy it still has, uh, the fud that we have to deal with, the 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 politicians raging against it. But I always try and look at what the story will be of the next kind of cycle, um, and like the last cycle for me was very much macro, which is why I think you've absolutely killed it because you're somebody who understands macro and Bitcoin. Uh, and and we've seen a lot of macro people who've done very well. Luke Guoman does very well. You know, Preston Pish does very well. All these macro uh, people who understand Bitcoin have done done very well. But I, I, I've, my head started to go into this space where I think the next four years or the next cycle is really a cycle of legitimacy. It's the one. It's probably my favorite thing about the ETFs. It's not the price run that will happen. It's not the institutions will be getting because I don't really care. But it's the legitimacy that it gives Bitcoin. When you have these large financial institutions with their influence creating the ETS and marketing Bitcoin, it's suddenly making it legitimate in front of their customers' eyes. It's making it legitimate within the industry. It's kind of probably making it more legitimate with regulators. And it feels like we may come out of this next four-year cycle where the anti-Bitcoin stuff won't just seem stupid to us. It might start to feel stupid to everyone. I think that's a reasonable expectation. I think it's somewhat tempered by if you see how um, traditional pools of capital treat gold over decades. Um, so multiple studies show that if you add a, a slice of gold to an otherwise stock bond portfolio, um, the risk adjusted of, uh, returns of that portfolio are better. And that's because gold tends to do well in decades where neither stocks nor bonds do particularly well. So the 1970s, the 2000s, for example, uh, it's, it's that non-correlated asset or it's a differently correlated asset. Um, and having that rebalancing slice in your portfolio was helpful, even though um, that was not very accepted. Uh, in in traditional pools of of, of capital, uh, even after decades, right? And and so there are kind of these these things that are on the periphery that they're you know they're the whole point is outside money, right? And mm. and so even if it's sometimes outside money that's encased in an inside wrapper, um, there's still kind of skepticism about it. So I think that somewhat tempers it, but I do think you're right that so this past cycle was about macro. I think the next cycle. There's kind of two things I'm I'm kind of looking at. One is 
I, I would call it macro 2.0, um, which is basically kind of the meme last cycle was institutions are coming and they never really came. I mean, around the margins they came, you know, hedge funds would trade Bitcoin. There's some entities that would do it. But for example, companies didn't really have the guts to follow, follow Michael Saylor into, you know, Bitcoin corporate treasury. Uh, we didn't see any um, Bitcoin ETFs. Um, uh, and so this cycle, assuming that these some of these Bitcoin ETFs get approved and, you know, again, these institutions see another higher high that, that kind of shakes them out of what they thought Bitcoin was. Um, I think you could have more normalization among institutions and actually have, you know, not just narratives about it, but actually allocations. Um, and so I think that's, that's one. Um, number two is I, you know, I think the, for me, the more optimistic one is the rise of these little Bitcoin hubs. And so, you know, Bitcoin beach is, is an obvious early example. Um, uh, but there's Bitcoin jungle, there's Bitcoin Lake, um, there's Bitcoin Akasi. I th- probably pronouncing that wrong. I was written rather than, yeah. Um, there's, you know, the, I think two years running the Bitcoin Indonesia conference, um, you know, uh, run by a woman named Dia. Um, there's two years running, uh, the Africa Bitcoin conference, uh, with Frida and others. And they basically these little, uh, recurring hubs, uh, around the world and in some of the markets where it's most important, Mm -hmm. uh, that I think is more powerful than even things like the Bitcoin commons, Bitcoin park, real Bedford, um, pub key. Uh, these pubs, these kind of locations within developed countries that are kind of these recurring, mm. you know, Bitcoin hubs. Um, I expect over the next cycle, uh, those to reach more critical mass. So this cycle was like the cycle of like those coming into existence, or at least, you know, after the initial few, there's been a spread of those. Uh, I actually did a, um, a podcast with um, uh, Kathy Wood the other day. And they're, they, they like track this and they, they kind of have like this number of how many of these little hubs that they're noticing. And it's like a crazy number per quarter. Hmm. Uh, most of them don't reach necessarily the awareness of the ones I mentioned, but there's a lot of these. Um, and if you fast forward four years, um, I expect these to be much bigger and more numerous. Um, and that's, that's in my view, one of the healthiest things if that occurs, that'd be one of the healthiest types of cycles. Yeah. Um, I love that. So that's, that's, I think the other half of the coin it, it's, you know, institutional liquidity, institutional capital is good because it can add liquidity to the Bitcoin network and take some of the edge off of volatility potentially, like, you know, that kind of rebalancing effect from portfolios and big pools of capital and widen the ownership to varying degrees that that's healthy for liquidity and, and volatility. But I think a better thing is the actual, you know, self custodial or community custodial um, hubs that are that are popping up. I think that's more important. Are we going to get Bitcoin pyramid? I would like to see it. Um, Egypt is not a market where it, it, there's kind of a combination where you need like countries with currency problems that also have hubs that are tech savvy have have tended to gravitate towards it. Um, so Nigeria, for example, is ranked very high in adoption. Uh, Argentina, obviously, Turkey. Um, a bunch of the, you know Vietnam, a bunch of these countries have that blend that's really powerful. Egypt, I think the challenge with Egypt is that until very recently, their currency problems are are non-continuous. Uh, and so instead of having inflation every year, um, they've masked it with reserve um, modification. So even though money supply is growing by like a very smooth rate of like twenty percent a year in Egypt, um, the peg to the dollar goes years without changing. And then it changes all at once, and it seems like a one-time thing. And then it goes back to not changing for years. And then it changes all at once again. And I think that over the next several years, it's going to become more and more apparent that this is not going to stop. Uh, and I think that could wake up more people to um, Bitcoin. In addition, there you know there are a lot of people doing the work to kind of argue that um, – uh, Bitcoin is is like uh, you know halal money. Like it's you know the, the fiat currency is based on riba. It's based on interest rates. It's based on credit. It's based on on things that you know some interpretations of of religions would prohibit. And Bitcoin is is you know more in line with with you know how how those those um, places view money. And so I, I do think that the Middle East in general um, you know really could catch on to Bitcoin. Um, I don't know if it'll happen next cycle. I'd like to see it happen. Um, but I do think in general, these hubs are going to pop up around the world. 
Yeah, I love them. I, I, I love the confidence people have now to do them. That you know, people go to PubKey and they're like, "Well, what can I do in my community?" There's a lot of. That. I mean, there's, there's. I think there's now four football teams that are Bitcoin clubs now. Uh, no, I love it. It's it, it's one of my favorite things about this. I'm conscious we're running out of time. Lynn, we could talk to her hours a day. Okay, um, let's. We need to wrap up. Um, I'm going to try and keep this almost like quick fire, <laughs> just to get through what we've got to get through. Okay. What are the things that we should be looking at with regards to the Fed? What do you think is going to happen? Do you think they might pivot? Um, so I think that they're going to like kind of consolidate for a period of time. Um, we'll see how much they cut. Uh, I'm not as dovish as maybe the consensus is, that I think that they might try to hold rates higher for longer than they think. Um, we could see a period, uh, especially after the reverse repos drained, where they go up to, to gradual balance sheet increases. So we might not see some gigantic QE, but they could go back to growing their balance sheet roughly in line with the rate of GDP growth. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see that happen. Um, and so I think that, that, would, that would be a, a kind of mildly dovish pivot if that were to occur. Okay, what about the bond market? What are you looking out for there? What should we keep an eye on? So, you know, right now there's been, you know, it got, it got really over its skis in terms of bearishness. It's been, there's been a bounce back. Um, I, I tend to view it as range bound, um, which is that, you know, yields going way below 3% would be kind of surprising to me, whereas yields going way above 6% would also be kind of surprising to me. Um, and so I, you know, I think that the shock and awe of the bond market, um, a lot of that's probably behind us now. Uh, and instead it's more range bound. Um, and to the extent that it gets out of that range, uh, is where you could have some of those previously mentioned Fed liquidity changes to, to get it back into the range. Um, so I think it's a, a pretty broad range, like three to six percent is actually a pretty broad range for bonds. Um, uh, so it's not exactly some like you know major call there, but basically I I I, I think that that's kind of the trend we're in probably for a period of time because that's kind of the Goldilocks that keeps keeps banks from blowing up. Um, still keeps the cost of capital um, non-zero. Uh, and I think that that's probably what they're going to try to target. Um, but again, on a quarter-by-quarter quarter basis, I see what what major variables are hitting that were not expected or that are changed. And so you know, you don't just lay out a, a case and never change it, but that's kind of my starting assumption. All right, last era, Bitcoin. Uh, also, you are a, an investor. Uh, with ego death, I assume that's public. I'm not sure I'm saying yes. anything that isn't public. What are the things that you're most interested, excited about in 2024 outside of ETFs and outside of halvings? Um, what I mentioned before is basically the, the hubs, Bitcoin hubs, hubs spreading around the world, and therefore any technology that empowers them, anything that allows like a them. Fediment. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and anything that helps that. So anything that allows communities to set up their own custody. Anything that allows them to, um, you know, build the, build their own custody solution, build their own wallets, uh, get liquidity, um, deal with scaling in a high fee environment. Uh, you know, the, the worst case scenario would be, you know, that all these hubs arise and all their bitcoins held by Binance or held by custodian X Y Z, right? Some gigantic, you know, multi billion dollar honeypot outside of their borders, outside of their community. Uh, it's much healthier, I think, to distribute that, empower communities as much as possible to be able to hold their own Bitcoin. And so custody is not entirely a Boolean thing of like the person custodies it or there's two extremes. Like there's you custody it, which is not extreme, but it's, it's one end of the spectrum is you custody it yourself. The other end is it's all in one gigantic shared honeypot. And then there's the spectrum on there is okay if, if you know some people you want to encourage as much as possible to self custody if they're if they can hold it if they can deal with the fees if they you know if they have that long enough time um, to be able to deal with that but if you want to have something in the middle is at least at least distribute that custody away from these gigantic pools and closer to their own community ideally in their own community um, so I think that's important I think anything that makes Lightning more solid is good. We'll see what happens with things like soft forks, covenants, uh, to see if there's other scaling solutions, or even just things don't require forks. Um, any, you know, any sort of promising scaling things that just make um, interacting with Bitcoin easier to do and cheaper to do and more efficient uh, while while preserving as much of the the ethos as possible. 
So it's really about those hubs and then about uh, empowering those hubs because you know Bitcoin has to win not just on its hardness, but on its, you know, what is the user experience of someone who comes to Bitcoin? Um, you know, what is it like for them to, to use um, the asset? Uh, and so I think that, you know, that's, it's gotten way better. Like I really liked, for example, the, um, the tap signer nunchuck combination. Yeah. And I'm not an investor in either of those. Um, but that's an example, I think, of, of a good sweet spot for UX, especially for smaller amounts. Um, and so I, I, I'm looking forward to see more of these kind of hybrid solutions that, you know, say, how can we, how can we get UTXOs spread out more? How can we get custody closer, at least closer to the person, um, and, and have them kind of experience Bitcoin as it's meant to be. Lynn, you are a freaking rock star. Uh, it's such a like honor and pleasure to get to talk to you so often. I, I, I know it's going to dwindle over time as you become more famous, successful, sought after, and we absolutely love that. Uh, perfect way to start the year. It's Lynn, Lynn Alden on the show. Also, 2024, we're going to get you to Bedford into a football match, which I cannot wait for, which is amazing. Looking forward to it. And I just wish you continued massive amounts of success and just thanks again for always being available to us. Thank you as well. And I appreciate you do for uh, for doing the hard work. Like, go, you know, not just talking about the same echo chamber stuff, but, you know, going to countries uh, and seeing what their what their experiences are and kind of reporting that to the world. I think that's important. Thank you. All right. Have a great new year. And uh, I think we're seeing you in January at some point. So see you soon. Yep. Bye.